Welcome to Kion's Lab, and today I want to introduce everybody to probably one of the coolest thermal interface materials I have ever come across. This is called Pyrolytic Graphite Sheet, or PGS for short. And more specifically, the kind that I'm holding right now is called a compressible thermal interface material manufactured by Panasonic. And it features some properties that are so amazing that I actually had to double check to make sure I was reading it correctly. So in this box here, I have three full sheets as well as one sheet that I've already cut, as well as the data sheet that I've printed out, some visuals I have printed out from various websites, as well as a couple of web pages, including the Wikipedia data sheet or a data page for this type of material. And we will go over all of that in this video. Links to all of the sources of information will be put into the description as well as on screen if there is space. So let's get into this material, what makes it so cool, how it's made and how I plan to use it. So just before going into the data sheet and going over the specs of this thing, I'm going to very quickly and very briefly go over some terms that I'm going to be using so that nobody is confused. So the first two terms are in a plane versus through plane when it comes to thermal conductivity. The link to the article that this image was taken from is provided here and will also be provided in the description. So when we begin going through the data sheet here, you will notice X, Y, and Z directions in reference to the thermal conductivities. And all that is referring to is through plane versus in plane, where thermal conductivity in the Z direction refers to the heat going through the material like this. So if I had a material like copper, aluminum, really anything, or even a piece of graphite like this, through plane thermal conductivity would refer to the heat going in from here and going out from there. And this is the type that most people would be familiar with. So for example, if you have a shim on your heatsink between a CPU and your heatsink, that would be through plane thermal conductivity. And as for in plane thermal conductivity, it is pretty straightforward. It is when the heat is actually going through along the X, Y axis of the material. I will try my best to leave this image in frame whenever I'm referring to these just to prevent any confusion. So now let's get into the cool part, the data sheet, because this is the part where I really could not believe the numbers I was seeing here. So this data sheet is a printout of the data sheet for this specific type of pyrolytic graphite sheet. Now it's not for this exact thickness of pyrolytic graphite sheet, because you can see here it's referring to the 200 micron, but I have the 100 micron sheet. So some of the numbers may vary by a tiny bit, but the overall information remains the same. So I'm going to briefly introduce this product on its own, the Panasonic Pyrolytic Graphite Sheet, before going into what makes it so unique as a material in general. So the Pyrolytic Graphite Sheet that I'm holding right now is actually a compressible type, as you can see in the image here. It is not compressible in the form that it will return to its original shape once compressed. You can see if I put my fingernail in here, it will hold its shape. So it's not like a standard thermal pad where if you take it off, it'll more or less come back like a memory foam pillow. So the fact that it is compressible like that makes it sort of act like a solid state thermal paste basically, where as you can see in the data sheet here, it says that it can actually form into the uneven parts of a heatsink, for example. However, as we begin to learn what unique properties this material has, we're gonna see that may not be the most important part of this material. Because using this as a substitute for a thermal pad is just the very beginning and not even the coolest part. So here's where it gets really interesting. Let's take a look at the thermal conductivity of this. So we can see here on the data sheet, in the X, Y direction, it has a thermal conductivity of 200 to 400 watts per meter Kelvin. Now, I believe this is referring to the 200 micron sheet because in the product uh, on the Mauser product page that I ordered this from, it stated a thermal conductivity of 700 watts per meter Kelvin because the one that I got is 100 microns or 0.1 millimeters thickness, which is two times thinner than the 200 micron. And as I briefly explained using this drawing here, when it says XY thermal conductivity, it is actually referring to the thermal conductivity in the in-plane direction. So along the actual material itself not through it, which is kind of pretty unique when it comes to this material. And that's kind of what caught my eye. I sort of thought that they had flipped these around or something, because when you take a look at the thermal conductivity in the Z direction, it is 28 watts per meter Kelvin, which would kind of be similar to a very good thermal paste. So I was thinking that how is that even possible for it to have a lower thermal conductivity by such magnitude in the through plane direction. So as you can see here, the through plane direction like that, of only 28 watts per meter Kelvin and then have hundreds of watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity in the in-plane direction. So like this, 
And at first, I sort of found that hard to believe until I started researching this material a little bit more and realized that this might actually not be as simple as I thought it was. Since, as I mentioned before, intuitively it was kind of hard to wrap my head around that a material, so I have brass here, would have a higher thermal conductivity in this direction than it would in this direction. And it wasn't until I started researching how this stuff is made and how it works the way it does that I actually started to better understand how this may be possible. Since unlike metals that are just made of the metal atoms in a lattice, it looks like the unique thermal properties of this material actually come from the actual structure of the graphite itself. So before getting into that, let's actually go into how this stuff is actually manufactured. So for this section, I will be referencing and more or less quoting from the website called hpmsgraphite.com. The link to the actual article will be provided in the description. And I have actually printed out the webpage itself since I didn't really want to cut and paste it directly onto the video where pyrolytic graphite sheets are created from a high temperature sintering process, where sintering, according to the Wikipedia page, which I might put a screenshot of here, is the process of compacting or forming a solid mass of material by pressure or heat without melting it to the point of liquefaction, where they state that the pyrolytic graphite sheets, the PGS sheets, are created from high temperature sintering by heating a polymer film, so some type of hydrocarbon, to its decomposition temperature in a vacuum and allowing it to carbonize. And most importantly, then graphitize, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, until left with a highly oriented graphite material. And that highly oriented is a pretty important contributor to the high thermal conductivities that this material exhibits. So before moving on to the next page, just quickly defining the word graphitize, where the process of graphitization or graphitization, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the heat treatment process where graphene layers, the two-dimensional graphene layers, which are usually in like a hexagon shape, are converted via heat treatment to a three-dimensional ordered graphite. And this is where I'm gonna bring in that other image I was talking about, as there exists different types of graphite. So here I have an image taken from a paper on the redox of enzymes and proteins using different electrodes. Not really the topic of this video, but they did have a very, very good image showing basically a close-up of highly ordered pyrolytic graphite. And the link to this article will also be in the description. So here you can see the individual graphene layers. So each of these is one graphene layer and how all of these together make the PGS or pyrolytic graphite sheet. And the fact that they are all aligned with each other like that makes it so that they are highly ordered. So in order to explain this a little bit better, here I have some generic graphite plates, which would basically be the same type of graphite that they would grind up into a powder and mix with clay and put into pencils and stuff. Nothing special about that, which would also contain little sheets of graphite on the inside. But the difference here is that they would not be highly ordered and in most cases would not be perfect sheets. They would be like tiny little broken pieces, like bits and pieces of, if you imagine like shards of glass and they're all against each other. So when you use something like a pencil, that's like a very dark pencil, like a B pencil, and you use it to draw on something, those little layers are coming off and going onto the paper. So again, nothing new there. And if I can find an image to basically try to demonstrate that, I'll probably put it somewhere here but that basically is the main significant difference between just generic graphite and these PGS graphite sheets. So going back to the article from HPMS Graphite, I'm gonna leave this probably there. So going back to this article, where they explain that the graphite's sheet-like crystals, and they're referring to the PGS here, the graphite's sheet-like crystals, known as graphene, are stacked on top of each other, just like in the image there, to allow for extremely high in-plane thermal conductivity and in plane referred to the x, y direction, that would be in this direction. So it allows for extremely high in plane thermal conductivity compared to its through plane conductivity, which is the z direction, like that. And this is the part that I find extremely interesting because as I mentioned earlier, it is sort of intuitive to think that something would have a higher thermal conductivity in the z direction rather than the x, y direction. But as we continue learning about this material, it seems like the fact that graphene on its own has such a high thermal conductivity combined with the fact that they are highly ordered on top of each other to make a sheet like this where the edge here would be represented from the edge or like the edge here makes it so that it is very effective at sending heat in the x y direction 
and it is still relatively effective at sending it in the z direction, but really excels in the xy direction, where it has hundreds of watts per meter kelvin thermal conductivity. And this opens up the door to a very, very large amount of very interesting possibilities and designs when it comes to thermal management. And just before I move on, also keeping in mind that graphite has a very low thermal mass, like this floats down like paper, yet it has such high thermal conductivity. It is basically something I found when I was looking for graphene, but I couldn't find any graphene sheets. So this was the closest I could get, but to be honest, this might even be better in some cases because it is quite a bit thicker, so it's easier to work with. And this massive thermal conductivity in the XY direction combined with its light weight, not to mention the fact that graphite also has a self-lubricating property. So if you have this in some kind of linear actuator, something I'm trying to do with my nitinol springs, this could be like a three-in-one solution where it acts like a power delivery rail that is self-lubricating, dry, and also dissipates the heat if you were to put a piece of copper foil behind it, for example. And not only that, these PGS graphite sheets have EMI shielding capabilities something I will be introducing the application of in one of my future videos. But I thought that was kind of important to also mention because this is a very, very interesting material. And going back to the article here where they have some example use cases, I am going to sort of skip over these for the most part because I have my own use cases, which I believe are much, much cooler than the basic uses where they have as a heat spreader here or a supplemental thermal management. It's interesting, but I have some much cooler stuff in mind. And I am also going to skip over this area here because it does bear a very close resemblance to a script I'm writing. Sort of unrelated to the subject, but I'm still going to skip over it. However, I do find it important to note how they say that the pyrolytic graphite sheets offer up to five times the thermal conductivity of copper at only a fraction of the weight, which again just keeps adding to the advantages of this material, with the only disadvantage really being the high price of it. So it has a high thermal conductivity, and I'm assuming this is for the 12 micron thick uh, film, 1800 watts per meter Kelvin, 1.8 kilowatts per meter Kelvin. When is the last time you heard of a metal or a thermal paste that had 1.8 kilowatts per meter Kelvin? And of course it is lightweight, reliable from minus 40 to 400 C, but then the big one that I just can't get over, the highly anisotropic structure which basically just means what I was saying earlier, how it has a much higher thermal conductivity in one direction than it does in the other. With a pretty good analogy I found for this being wood, where you can split it across the grain quite easily, but try bending the wood in the other direction and it's kind of hard. Except with that example, it's more of a mechanical nature where here you have a thermal anisotropic property. But I just cannot iterate how important this is for designing innovative thermal management systems the fact that it acts more like an insulator than a thermal conductor when it's like this. So if the heat was inside of here and trying to go outside, it would act more like a insulator in that sense, but it would route all of that heat in the XY plane to the edges here. So you could have like, I'm going to get into this in probably either this video or if it gets too long in a future video where I've been working on designing some very, very interesting thermal management systems. So I've folded the page in half here because they're bringing up many of the same points that I'm going to be making, and I really don't want to spoil it because it's going to be really cool. But basically here they're talking about using the PGS as a thermal interface to substitute your normal thermal pads for a variety of devices. And for anyone who's watched my supercapacitor videos, when they say high power batteries, well, I'm thinking, how can I apply this to high power capacitors that have quite a bit of heat dissipation requirements when operating at such high wattages. And solar panels, that's something I didn't think of, so that's pretty interesting. Solar panels also do need cooling. They also mentioned that it's a potential alternative for thermal paste and thermal grease. And while they do mention superior heat spreading for battery cooling, which is exactly what I was thinking of before I even read this article, before I even clicked on the link, I have something even cooler in mind because it's not just going to be heat spreading. And I'm not going to spoil anymore, but it's going to be much, much cooler than that. And I'm not just talking about niche applications here. This is going to be like cooling solutions that will be usable for everyday electronics. For the past several months, I've been coming up with all sorts of interesting designs to use this because, okay, you know what? I'm going to spoil a little bit of it. I plan to make the first thermal wires, or essentially you can think of it as a 
solid state heat pipe, but much, much more effective, thinner, lightweight, non-metallic. This is going to be an insane series of videos. It is going to be so cool.